Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are revisiting the topic of money. <laughs> my guest is my old friend, Daryl Robert Schoon. Daryl is a minister with the Temple of Universality in Tucson, Arizona, a spiritualist church. He is also the author of a number of books, including You Can't Always Get What You Want, Light in a Dark Place, The Time of the Vulture, Report to the House Select Committee on Intelligence, Is God Confused? and the way to heaven. In addition, he's an entrepreneur and part owner in two small businesses, one selling condoms and another business in the uh, nutritional supplements area, C60 to be precise. Welcome, Daryl. It's an honor to be here, Jeffrey, which I'm finding out more and more with each interview we do. <laughs> It's an honor for me to have you, a dear old friend, one of my oldest friends, visit Thank you. Uh, Albuquerque. I'm very pleased to be with you. And I remember five months ago, we had a, a dynamic, exciting discussion about the nature of money. And mm. particularly, we got into the nature of paper money. Mm. I think today, to, to go a little deeper, we might talk about the way in which money is used. Money is used differently for each of us for different reasons. For the vast majority of humanity, money is used to survive. They're at a very low, they have very ac little access to what we call money, what is called money today. And there are cultures that don't even have money. They're subsistence cultures, agriculture, okay? And you don't have to be without, and this doesn't mean that if you don't have a circulating medium that we call money, that they're at the poverty line. You can have quite quite substantial communities without money that are doing quite well, all right? But for the most part, in this 21st century, if you, you know, those without circulating medium of what we call money are very impoverished. There, there, is a, there is a greater economy where money circulates and it basically is now collected at the top. I wrote a paper on this called uh, Monetary Edema. And I said, in the last, in the late stage of capitalism, you have, it gives rise to a condition that can be referred to as monetary edema, where excess monetary creation creates a situation where excess money becomes trapped in financial markets. All right. That the central banks are trying to get this into the general economy to raise general demand because demand is falling. And they know that if demand continues to fall, it's like blood pressure. The system will die. The patient will die. So they are frantically trying to pump more money into the system to raise demand. But what happens is in late state capitalist economies, which we are in, it gives rise to a situation that I've called monetary edema, where the money does not enter the general population or the general economy. It gets sideswiped into a condition where the money collects inadvertently to those trying to put it into the system in financial markets, which causes the prices of financial assets, stocks, real estate, bonds, commodities to rise artificially due to the amount of money being printed, not because of real economic demand. That's where we find ourselves today. Now, sort of like the throth bubbling up to the top of yes, your cup of coffee. <laughs> yes, but it's only going in certain parts yeah. of the coffee, mm -hmm. not the part that you want, not well, the part that you consume. I heard an interesting statistic. Uh, I normally like to do timeless programs, but we just listened to a, a Democratic primary debate <laughs> recently, and one of the participants was the billionaire Michael Bloomberg. I like Michael Bloomberg personally, but uh, Bernie Sanders, whom I also like, pointed out that Bloomberg has as much wealth as the bottom 120 million Americans. And I realize if that's the case, it means that those people have on average, uh, maybe 
four or five hundred dollars in assets available to handle an emergency. And I, I've heard that before, that we're a rich country, and yet we're talking about a third of the population, if they had to meet some sort of Can't an emergency it. payment, they cannot make it. So, so that's what you mean by mom, money bubbling up to the top. Yes. Now, <laughs> it's not because Michael Bloomberg works harder than that lady with three jobs trying to support her kids. All right? And the rich people can say, well, these are bad choices. She shouldn't have had all those babies. All right? Or she should have gone to college. All right? Or, well, I think they might simply say he was smarter. And, I, and I'm sure he's a very smart man. Yes. That's one reason. Yeah. And that's one answer. Mm -hmm. um, there, are, we, we, you know, Edwards Deming, who I know through my friend Marshall, was a brilliant man. Marshall Thurber, Thurber. who keeps coming up in our conversation. Because it's me you're talking to. <laughs> All right. I met Marshall in law school, and he made the, the friendship of two extraordinary people, Buckminster Fuller and later Edwards Deming. Okay? And Marshall loved Bucky. Because Marshall had written a paper in college on utopia. At Union College, it was a very high-powered select university in New England. All right? And he wrote a paper on utopia, which is not a... And it wasn't a socialist dream. It was... I, I never read the paper, so maybe it was a socialist dream. Mm -hmm. But Marshall's not, quote, what we call a... Uh, ideological well, socialism. Many people have envisioned what an ideal society that perhaps is possible ought to be possible. Very good. I love your ability to expand these conversations between the parameters I keep dropping them into. Because <laughs> yeah, it's not just about Marshall. No, no it isn't. It isn't. But Marshall had written a paper on utopia. And Bucky really exemplified that feeling that we could have one. And Bucky said that right now, technology may, has made the human race capable of providing more than enough for everybody, which is not the cultural assumption that we have of scarcity, which is exacerbated by the fact that in money, for example, there may be, an, <laughs> in Marshall's view, there may be enough money for everybody, but the way the system is constructed, it is all at one end of the scale, Okay that most people are experiencing various levels of survival issues, and the other ones are experiencing, what the hell am I going to do with all my cash? Okay. Which we have negative interest rates. There's so much cash at one end of the scale. Well, I, I feel like I'm in the middle. You guess. Yeah. Now, Edwards Deming, an extraordinary person who, who Marshall met around 10 to 15 years after his experience with Bucky. Marshall is always fascinated with new ideas, all right? And Edward Deming, at that time that Marshall went to look for him, was known as the man who transformed Japan. Mm -hmm. That the Japanese took out a full-page ad every year in the Wall Street Journal thanking Dr. Deming for bringing them from a, a country that was just blown out by two atomic bombs to the top of the pile in terms of industrial achievement. And now America was trying to figure out what it was. So there, Ford Motor Company was trying to figure out, maybe it was rice there, that caused the Japanese to excel. The Japanese said, hey, it's him, Dr. Deming. Well, that's because the Americans didn't follow Dr. Deming. All right? They have their own theories. But Dr. Deming was a quality control export, expert who had found himself in Japan at the end of World War II, and the Japanese knew they had trouble with quality, so they looked around for somebody to help them. Yeah, I mean, at the, at the time, I remember the 1950s, if you wanted to talk about a cheap product, Japan. poorly made, that breaks quickly, it would be j something out of Japan. They were the poster boy of poor quality. Yeah. And they knew that after we had blown them out of the water with two atomic bombs, devastating things, that the Japanese power elite knew that they, that they had to ex export to live because they have very few re natural resources and their quality reputation was terrible and what they had to do about it. And then since we had, since the United States had dropped the bomb on them, they thought the United States must have the answer. So as fate would have it, as cultural dharma would present the case, uh, they heard that a quality control expert was then in Japan at the behest of General MacArthur. But he was there not to improve their quality. He was there to help with the census. Okay. But they called him in. And Deming looked at him and he said, if you follow my ideas, in three years, the, the rest of the world is going to be asking for protection. And they followed his ideas. 
Why? Extreme emergency. And as Bucky Fuller said, emergence through emergency is how the world changes. Japan found itself in a state of extreme emergency, followed Deming's advice to a degree that no one would ever have done unless they were in that position because it was non-hierarchical. And Japan was a very hierarchical traditional culture, top down. And Deming said, you have to give the power over the production line to the workers. Wow. And they followed his advice. And within the next 10 years, Japan went straight to the top of the charts. All right. So Marshall, after having this wonderful experience with Bucky Fuller, who filled all his heart with all the Bucky things about reality and how we're going to get there and there's enough for everybody and we're all Earthians on the planet Earth and Marshall ate that up like a, like the like the believer he was, predisposed to believe what Bucky said, now then started after Deming. So he booked two days with Dr. Deming. Deming charged $10,000 a day. Marshall read every one of Deming's books out of the crisis. Deming was an engineer. And engineers don't write easily. Marshall read everything that Deming wrote and made little notes about it. So in his first day with Deming, at $10,000, he sits down. Now, Deming is used to talking with corporations or representative corporations. Xerox, GE, all the major corporations were coming to him for advice. And here's this guy sitting across the room. And uh, Marshall asks him a question. And Deming answers. And Marshall says, stop. Did that come from... And he goes to his briefcase and he takes out this thing and he's got all these notes. Deming realizes that Marshall has got him down to a T because Marsh, 10 grand is a lot for Marshall. So he answers three more questions and Deming goes, who are you? To Marshall, usually it's, you know, mm-hmm. who do you represent? Marshall says, no one, myself. Marshall was there after the knowledge. He had nothing. He knew that Deming was the font of knowledge and wanted to know why. And Demi goes, because he's used to corporations coming to go write this off. He goes, how much money do you have? <laughs> and Marshall says, a lot less after today. Demi said, okay, tomorrow's on the house. Right? Mm-hmm. But established Demi's recognition of Marshall's thoroughness into preparing for his conversations with his two days with Demi. Marshall became very close to Demi. And only because of Marshall do I know anything about Demi and about Bucky Fuller, which we're going to get to later. But Demi's theory was this. Everything is because of the system. We blame people for failure. He says it's systemic. And he says the way a system is designed is going to lead to the outcome. And in the first 15%, you're going to find all the problems that come out later in the system. All right? So the first 15% percent of, of, this, of the initial creation of the system. Okay. You are going to find all the foibles and faults and apparent dysfunctions that are later manifested in, in the system. The first 15% of, of finding errors or quality no, The first 15% of any system uh-huh. is going to lead to every error in the later, latter 85% of your experience. All right. So let's, he says, go back to fundamentals. Go back to how you designed your system. And he, do, he said, there is no pr- human error is not the great cause of systems, which we believe. Everything is produced because somebody made a mistake. Deming was a firm believer in the system itself. And that's why he had these things called mission statements. We just make up these mission statements to convince other people that's right. Deming said that was critical to the success of any corporation. He said you had to get every, the buy-in. You had to get the buy-in of everybody involved in the enterprise. Now, this runs directly contrary to capitalism. Capitalism is a system. Everybody's a piece. And the system is designed by bankers to accumulate wealth with the bankers and those of the elites at the top. What I'm saying, Jeffrey, is this. The fact that we have a huge disparity of wealth is not by accident. It's systemic. And it's systemic in the sense that it was a, is a result of a system that's only been around for the last 300 years. All right? And, and by a, system, you now mean Capitalism. capitalism. And what we call capitalism is not free markets. Free markets existed before capitalism. Cap And the capitalists like to say, oh, we're about free markets. I always said that the rise of communism was the biggest PR coup for the capitalists. Because then the capitalists would say, look at that! Look at that! Is that what you want? Come to daddy! 
communism only arose in opposition to the massive advantage that capitalism was able to accrue. All right? And it arose not in the systems that Marxists said it was going to. By Marxist theory, socialism was going to rise and overthrow capitalism in highly developed industrialized economies. Cap socialism, or what we call communism, which is as pure as capitalism, they're not. They're distorted by human nature and what they did to, quote, systems. Communism arose in basically huge agrarian societies that were about to be swallowed up by the Western capitalist powers, England and the United States. All right. England had already absorbed and <laughs> digested India, which was huge. And they had their sights set on China and Russia. So the Chinese and Russians are scrambling around. They have no way to oppose this maw of, that they're about to be absorbed into. And so being students, they grabbed an off-the-box, untested system called communism, which led to a horrible experiment. Why? Not because sharing the wealth is a bad idea, but because the system that we know as communism and I think that's an inappropriate way to share the wealth, but it was basically band-aids when you've got hemorrhaging going on. Concentrated power to a degree heretofore unknown. It concentrated ideology, education, politics, and economics in, the, in a party. And you give humanity enough power, it's going to get ugly. Ugly. We have a little off-the-wall saying, Power corrupts, absolute power cor corrupts absolutely, all right? A Frenchman once made a comment, I forget who he was, but it was beautiful. He said, if you want to see a man's character, don't give him money, give him power. And if you give him power, you will see his character. There's a beautiful observation on human nature, all right? One of my sayings is, Jeffrey, until humanity changes, History will not. All right? Be that as it may, we are at the end of a major economic paradigm that has brought us everything that has brought us. Great wealth, great technological achievement, a level of standard of living for the vast majority of humanity that never existed before, but also now in its last stages, the vast disparity of wealth within that system. Even in the, in the most advanced capitalist economies, you're having the greatest disparity of wealth. The United States mm -hmm. and in England. It is accumulated at the top because of a condition that I call monetary edema. But this is only the last stage. It is being, it was leading towards that inevitably anyway. All well, right. Feudal systems had enormous disparity between the aristocracy and, and the, the peasants. Okay. Now, Bucky Fuller, who I love. Yeah. Is was brilliant, okay, and and Marshall was very close to Bucky for years, okay, and I was really busy in my own world. So as Marshall was busily following Bucky around, I was busily trying to stay out of prison or trying to get to prison, being a drug dealer, a hippie drug dealer, and I was just on the road to and this metaphysical truth that I was all the time. Marshall had a week-long event at Kirkwood Meadows in 1981. Martha was there with Bucky. Bucky was there the whole week, okay? This was the week where Kiyosaki, who became famous for Rich Dad, Poor Dad, met Bucky and had his, his life-changing conversation with Bucky, okay? I sort of saw Bucky as this idealist, this genius who invented blah, blah, which didn't really, what didn't concern me. I wasn't concerned about the things that apparently Bucky was talking about. But something happened because of Marshall and Bucky way after Bucky died. Bucky died in 1983. All right. In 2007, eight, I, Bucky became front and center on my consciousness because of Marshall. The year before in 2007, I had delivered my talk at the Positive Deviant Network on March 4th in a 148 page paper where I predicted the collapse and the economic, severe economic crisis was going to happen. The title of my thing was called The Time of the Vulture, which we had discussed before came from a 
a, a words I had heard in 1991 in prison after a period of intense meditation that predicted the collapse of the economic economy. We could call it a download. A download, because it just came to me. Yeah. In a series of words that impressed me so much, I wrote them down. Why don't we repeat them now? They're worth repeating. In times of expansion, it is to the hair the prize goes. Quick risk taken and bold, his qualities are exactly suited to the times. In times of contraction, the tortoise is favored. Quick only to detract, retract his vulnerable head and neck, the slow and sure is preferable to the quick and easy. There comes a time, however, when neither the hare nor the tortoise is the victor. This is the time of the vulture. The vulture feeds neither upon the stored up wealth of the bear or the pastures of the bull, which lie buried deep beneath the rubble of economic collapse. The vulture instead feeds upon the blind denial and ignorance of the ostrich. The time of the vulture is at hand. All right? 1991. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I set him aside. Like I just said before, the only person I showed him to in prison at Federal at Terminal Island was a former, was a, I'm sure he was, a, and still is, I think he's passed away, is a Republican. He was part of Reagan's, inner, you know, kitchen, not kitchen, but his rangers that raised all this money. He'd been a big, big RV dealer at a certain time, and his fortunes had turned, so he decided that it had turned so badly because it's a high... In a downturn, which is probably in the 80s that caught him unawares, he convinces his nephew, who, who's a, who has a printing shop, to print money. Now, printing money with no backing out of thin air is the way money is created. But there's a monopoly on this, and only those who can do it legally are allowed to get away with it. He who did it on his own and paid the price by ending up in prison. But he was the only one I showed my little thing to. Richard Wattell read this and go, wow, because he understood it. He, he, he was about money. Mm -hmm. And I read something to him that shook him. Now, I didn't show this to anybody else at prison, in prison. I don't think at the time, maybe, but I really don't think I did. Kept it myself. But it was significant. It's significant so much so that I began studying economics in the 1990s that led me to Professor Antoff. And I want to say about my Journey about Professor Antal Fekete. This is how I am led, and I think it's leading me. Mm -hmm. That wherever that quote came from led me on the subsequent path where it led me to. Because in, I, by the end of the 1990s, I had come to the conclusion that gold had a lot to do with this deal, or the absence of it. The taking away of gold had destabilized our monetary system. Gold was there theoretically as a backdrop against the paper money. All right, but it's only there as a charade, like your FDIC $250,000 insurance policy. It's a charade. No fund exists. The FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Fund, does not exist. It doesn't exist. There's no money in it. There's no set aside. And yet that is on every <laughs> savings and loan and bank in the country. Uh, you, can be, you don't have to worry about your money, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. It's insured by the FDIC. doesn't exist. Which I found out when a Republican administration came in, I forget which one it was, and the newly appointed head of the Treasury wanted to see the fund. I mean, he was now head of the Treasury. So he asked about it, and the word came back, <clears throat> quit asking that question. What? We don't ask that question. The fund doesn't really exist. It was there to set the hearts and minds of l Americans that their savings were not at risk like they were during the Great Depression. So you put your money in our banks. If they go down, we're backed by this FDIC fund. The fund doesn't exist. Well, it's about trust. <laughs> or the absence of the reasons thereof. Mm -hmm. You're right. It is about trust. And so the money that we operate from is a trust that has value. And at one time, it did have value at a, in a certain way. It, it was guaranteed that if you went to the, F, to the Federal Reserve, which issued your money, you could get gold for it. All right? That it was backed by 30, you could get thir, uh, one, you could get one ounce of gold for 32 US printed dollars. That was the set price of gold ever since the FDI, ever since the Fed came to existence in 1912. 
1913. Prior to 1913, all the money in the United States was issued out of the U.S. Treasury. And it was, which had gold. The Treasury had all our gold and silver. Mm -hmm. And it printed our money. In 1913, the creation of the Federal Reserve, every dollar that was issued out of the Fed came from the Federal Reserve and no longer from the Treasury until 19. 63 when President Kennedy issued $20 million of silverback $20 bills, which were, we call within the year, and all the silver was sold, so we couldn't do it again. Okay? The money was there to reassure the public that it was as good as gold. In fact, for decades, the saying about the U.S. dollar was, it was good as gold. And truly it was. I want to say something. It wasn't always. In fact, in fact, in 1933 and 34, there was so little gold in the U.S. Treasury that there was no longer enough gold to meet the statute limitation of how many, how much gold we were supposed to have in the Treasury because the collapse of the banking system had caused all the rich people to go and ask for the gold, to go to the Treasury and, because now things had gone to the shithole yeah. and the rich people knew it. So they started converting their paper money into gold because we were under system extreme systemic distress. Mm -hmm. Because we had gone below the regulatory level at which we needed gold, what FDR and the, and the Fed did was confiscate everybody's gold. And so, this is how they confiscate it. We'll give you uh, $32, which was the standard price of gold for all your gold. And they did. And immediately after they did it, they devalued it and they raised the price of gold to everybody, to 37. All right? So all the people who gave in their gold under duress had less a month later than they had before. Okay? But what they didn't know was that the, the gold reserves of the Treasury had sunk so low, they had to do it. FDR was forced to do it. And he did. Well, what happened is, this is 1934. Then the war started. All right? And because we had an artificially high price of gold, the U.S. did during that time, and all these other countries were in extreme trouble fighting World War II, all that gold flowed into the United States. All those rich people who were around the world, who were now under duress, sent their gold to America and got dollars for their gold. Because at that time, the dollars were now worth more than the gold was. Because we had an artificially high price of gold. At the end of World War II, the United States had most of the monetary gold in the world for the first time in history. We had more gold than Croesus had because we had an artificially high price. Croesus meaning the ancient king. Okay. So, in... 1949, the United States had, I believe, 23,775 tons of monetary gold, metric tons of gold, the greatest stash of gold in the history of the world, all right? In the history of the world. The, that was audited. We had it there. Well, what happened to that gold? Well, what happened was this. In the next 20 years, we spent so much money that basically there was a run on gold that we didn't know about. But that's what had happened. That's what happened to our gold. What happened was this. And somebody said, well, how could we have a run on gold? Weren't we net importers? Because the only reason gold was exchanged between countries, Jeffrey, was the disparity in trade. All right? And if you had a disparity in trade, you could make up for that disparity in the transfer of gold between central banks. Between 1949, when we owned 80% of the gold on the planet, to 1979, when Nixon suspended and shut the gold window, that's what we call it. In other words, don't come to us with U.S. dollars for gold at $37 an ounce, $32 an ounce. It's not, we're not on the table anymore. You can't do that. We're not going to give you that money. We shut the gold window. Between 1949 and 1979, when we did it, the gold began flowing out of the U.S., like a river. Why? Not because of trade. It was because for the first time in history, we had a worldwide military presence that was extraordinary. In peacetime, usually the cost of war goes way down. Okay? Not in the United States. After 1992, to establish a military hegemony over the rest of the world, we already had an economic hegemony. We already were the most powerful 
industrial machine in the world. We had a positive trade balance with every other country in the world. We could produce goods faster and better than anybody else. All right. What happened was the trade started going out so much. We, we had our, the cost of our military presence in Asia, Europe, you know, Trump is bitching about NATO doesn't pay their share of their military budget. And they don't. You know why? We didn't want them to. We wanted to pay for it and have control over Europe. By the fact that we had the military machine that protected Europe, Asia, and the rest of the world, we were king ship. So we were willing to do that at the cost of the gold going out. Yeah. Why? Because the gold people were not the same as the military people. The gold people were the people going, holy smokes, the gold's going out. We can't have this. The military people said, screw you. We want military hegemony. And they did. So they were able through, through the U.S. Congress to establish military presence all over the world, flow of gold, so much gold flowed out that we were now about to go bankrupt. Well, that's what they did in 71. They said, give us three more years. We're not going to have a penny of gold in here. We're not going to have an ounce. So they shut the gold window. They asked Volcker, Volcker, what should we do? Should we? And he asked John Exter. John Exter is an extraordinary man. John Exter is, most Americans know of Alan Greenspan, who was a monetary expert head of the Federal Reserve. He was a central banker. They really should know the story of John Exter. Extraordinary man, okay? And uh, Volcker, when he was caught in the rock in the hard place in 1971, he was Nixon's undersecretary of the treasurer. He came and asked Exter what we should do. That's how Exter's standing was in the community. He didn't ask Greenspan, he asked Exter. And Exter said, well, you have a choice. Paul, you could, re you could uh, devalue the dollar against gold, okay, and, keep, and stop the flow of dollars going out, or you could shut the gold window. And Extra said, you know, I don't think I can sell politically revaluing the dollar. So he told Nixon, shut the gold window. And he did, with the support of Milton Friedman, who the conservatives loved. Free market Friedman. Free market Friedman didn't believe in gold. He was like Keynes, who was managed markets Keynes. All right? Both of them didn't believe in gold. They thought gold was, one of the word descriptions of gold at the time was gold and fetters. Well, fetters mean they restrict your movement. All right? So they kept you from, in, from doing what you wanted to do. Well, the golden fetters were there for a reason, because the amount of monetary creation was dependent on the amount of gold that you had. When they removed the, the fetters, the explosion of the money supply went bananas all around the world, and especially in the United States. And my understanding is that at, at that time, money became backed not so much by gold, but by debt itself. Money, no. Okay, this is not quite happened, and yeah. this is why... The, you 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 have that thought because in a way it's true in a way it's not true. Mm -hmm. Ever since the creation of capitalism, which we can trace back to the Bank of England in 1695, all the money issued out of the central bank was issued backed by reserves of species, precious metals, but it was issued in the form of debt. Every dollar, that's why you hear, if every debt was repaid, money would disappear. That's true. And let me tell you, money hasn't disappeared. There's a lot of it floating around. You know what that means? There's a whole lot of debt out there. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the questions that I asked myself when I first began thinking about money in the 1990s was, where did the money go? Because if we had a Great Depression in the 1990s, that meant there was no money. My theory, what happened to the money? Well, the answer that I got when I finally figured it out was money was not what we thought it was. Money was actually, even then in the 1930s, merely circulating credit and debt. And when the debts defaulted to such a degree, it, everybody went bankrupt and the banks would no longer issue credit to people because they were afraid they were going to get repaid. So money, in a tangible, physical sense, stopped circulating. It was about trust once again. Trust had disappeared. Yeah. You couldn't trust the banks. You couldn't trust money. 
Mm -hmm. So how they revivified and restored markets after World War II was to restore the trust. FDIC, the government basically socialized yeah. the system. You got a government guarantee. And Roosevelt tried to get an extraction from the banks. Yeah. Now, I want to uh, uh, interject again, if I may, Daryl, because you started by talking about how the capitalist system intrinsically is designed for the benefit of those on top. Yes. Well, clearly, Bloomberg wasn't around when it was designed. We can't lay the sins of the fathers upon the sons who have so greatly benefited by the sins of the father. But you have raised the issue, what were those sins, Daryl, and how did it happen? Okay? Now, money was a circulating of exchange between people out of trust. Mm -hmm. And in a previous talk, when I talked about money itself, I said the first people who abrogated this was the Chinese on a massive scale. Other people tried to do it because they circulated coins and they'd start clipping the coins. Yeah. All right? The Romans would circulate uh, Roman silver coins and started making the coins smaller and smaller and smaller. Those of us in the United States can see this happening with the size of our Hershey bars. The Hershey bars got smaller and smaller and smaller, all right, at the same price, all right, because they're doing the same thing. They've got a commodity, circulating commodity. Everybody's used to using it, but everything's going up, so they want to make more yeah. money. So what the governments did was they started making the coins smaller, 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 right. okay? Well, it really got out of control when the Chinese substituted paper for coins. Then they could really go to the races, okay? So, like I said, they had all these encounters with hyperinflation, which never really existed before the Chinese did it. And after the Chinese got into the game, it went, it came in with regularity. Mm -hmm. All right. We could call this monetary dysentery. If we're going to call the collection of money in financial markets a, a, a monetary edema, we could call hyperinflation or deflation the uh, monetary uh, dysentery. <laughs> Something that came along that cleaned everything out. And if left untreated, was fatal. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, the Chinese had taken money, paper money, and gone to do the markets and really destabilized. And the Chinese love stability more than anybody else. This really screwed them up. All right? Be that as it may, the temptation was too great for every dynasty not to indulge in it. Print more. Okay? So, it reappears in England in 1694 through the Bank of, through the, through the creation of the Bank of England. The Bank of England was created because William Patterson, the Scotsman, approached King William III, all right, who had enormous war debts because he was fighting with his relatives over Europe. And he owed billions in debts, okay? And at this time, the debts were personal against the kingdom, not against the country. Why? The country had no assets except for the king's. And King William was the country. He was England. All right? So he owed all this money. And so Patterson goes to him and goes, hey, uh, King, <laughs> whatever they call each other. All right? Hey, King, listen, we got a deal. If you let us, if you allow us to create a bank and charter it called, we'll call it the Bank of England. The word bank, bank didn't even exist before. It's derived from the Jewish word that the goldsmiths used to sit on benches, banks. All right, and deal with gold. All right, so that's where the word derived from. Well, so the first banks, there weren't bankers before 1694. Now we've got bankers everywhere. Okay, but then it, they didn't exist. The, the term didn't even exist. So after 1694, he said, listen, if you allow us to circulate um, credit, letters of credit, or uh, whatever speech, if you allow us to circulate, I, I, it wasn't, you know, letters, but it was a term like that. It was like that. Yeah. If you allow us to do that, we will loan you the money to pay off your debts. They loaned the King of England, I think, eight billion dollars at eight percent interest. And in what form? In gold? In cash? That's a great question. Yeah. We weren't there. Yeah. But I suspect what they did was this: once King William gave him the right to do it. And that, and the Bank of England could issue currency alongside the silver and gold coinage. They gave him eight billion dollars in paper money, mm -hmm. where he could pay off all his debts in paper money. 
That was a great question, Jeffrey, because mm -hmm. I thought about it myself. And what happened was he was able to do it because it was he owed the debts to people in England, the ship people, the people who built the ships and all this kind of stuff. So he was able to pay off his debts with paper money, and the Bank of England can now issue money in the form of credit to anyone mm -hmm. who they wanted to issue to. Well, bankers being bankers, they only issued the credit basically to the King of England and corporations, like the West Indies Company. Mm -hmm. If you were a shopsmith on what was going to become High Street, and you had all these hats, you made these great hats, let me assure you, in 1696, you couldn't get a loan from the Bank of England unless the king or queen was your customer. Now, if you could guarantee to me that these were, that those fops wearing those hats and those women were defined, were wearing your hats as a banker at the Bank of England, and you guarantee that, I would go, ah, oh, yes. So that's when it became important that you were the hattier, a provider of millinery to the royal house. That meant you were bankable. So I would give you a loan. Now, to everybody else, you couldn't get those loans. It, it was so bad that, that when we had a collapse in 1930s due the, in the Great Depression, the uh, car companies couldn't even get loans for the banks. The car companies could not get, you as a consumer could not get a, a, a consumer loan to buy the cars. Mm -hmm. The corporations had to create their own banks to give their customers loans. Mm -hmm. This is why, this is why Henry Ford hated bankers so much. They wouldn't give credit to anybody. Mm. The only people that bankers would give credit to in the United States during the Great Depression, he came back to bite them, was not only the United States of America and the top corporations. They gave, they would loan money only to farmers with their land as, 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 as chattel, as their equity. equity. Yeah. And what happened? It shocked the shit out of the bankers. The Great Depression happened at the same time as the Dust Bowl. Those farms became worthless. The bankers were holding zero assets. Land became worth nothing. The price of land in the United States, which was their great title, title, title became the important thing. The titles became nothing, both for land and commercial property, because commerce basically stopped in their tracks. Landlords lost their property. The banks ended up owning title to empty buildings and a worthless land. Only the United States coming back in and vivifying, restoring the markets and World War II putting an external demand on the system caused the great engine to start again. Mm -hmm. Okay, now. Let us fast forward to now. The money, which was theoretically backed by gold, was only backed by gold in 1971, and the only people who could do it were countries. You and I couldn't even go to the Fed and get gold for our money. Okay, so it was a restricted game, all right? It all changed b because we had blown away the, the gold. We'd spent all the gold. Okay. You know, they, the, the idea that it was backed by gold was a slogan. Good as gold. It once was, is no longer. And that's the thing that David Hackett Fisher said in his book, The Great Wave. David Hackett Fisher said, in times of deep change, change happens faster than our ability to understand and adapt. It has gotten away from us. It has truly gotten away from us. We keep ideas in our head that make us secure from a world that no longer exists. We, this is why I think the reaction of the right is so incredible at this time. Because change has happened in such, such increments that everybody got scared. Everybody's scared. We don't know where we're going. And the foundations of the past that used to give us sustenance and, 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 and allowed us to sleep at night, like democracy, Political parties, capitalism, higher education are being swept away. Higher education is no longer the problem as it was. It's a millstone around the neck of students who are paying huge amounts of money that they'll never be able to pay back. This has changed in 20 years. All right? The idea of capitalism being a, a, a promise of a better generation for every generation is gone. It's gone. Okay? Young people don't believe they're going to do better than their parents. Because they're not going to. Okay? Because we're at the end of a system. Mm -hmm. We are at the end. The, the defining context of our system, uh, Jeffrey, 
is, and that's why money is so important, because it's, it's, it was the very thing that caused, uh, England to accrue its empire. Only England could go to war on credit. <laughs> a great advantage. I mean, Mao Zedong may have said that power came out of the, the barrel of a gun, but the letter of credit that allowed you to, to buy the cannery came out of the banker's credit. Mm. All right. And they were quite sure that England was a great place to do it because England just got bigger and bigger and bigger until it couldn't get any bigger anymore. And this all happened in the mid 19th century. Not only did England's empire stop growing, which is necessary for a capitalist system to grow because it always must produce more productivity to pay off constantly compounding and accruing debt or the debt's going to eat it up. Yeah. So England reached its limitations in the mid 1800s when it couldn't expand any more beyond, beyond India, all right? And not only that, there was, at the same time, the Industrial Age caught up with England, and they had, a, they had to shift their navy, which is the base of the power, from wood to, to metal. And that was really expensive. So by the time the early 20th century came around, England was already in trouble. Yeah. And the bankers knew it. So what the bankers decided to do was jump ship. They don't jump shit. They like England. They like, they like the tea. They like the houses. They like the finery. But what they did was they create their own system in America, in the Federal Reserve. Now, this went to the root of the American Revolution. Thomas Jefferson said there are two threats to our fledgling democracy, the bankers and the standing armies. Now, Thomas Jefferson started this goddamn thing. From nothing. Before him, it was a tyranny of kings. Yeah. Okay? So what they did in the United States was rather extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And only those who thought of it are quite responsible for the extraordinariness of what they created. So I think we ought to give due credit to Thomas Jefferson. Because he was one of the few forefathers did one, one of the reasons he had such a distaste for bankers is that he himself was deeply in debt oh yeah nobody liked bankers the well, bankers controlled everything they controlled everything but jefferson was specifically aware that the power of the banker would abs would end up with the bankers owning everything you know what he said if we allow private banking there will become a time when your homes are owned by the bankers themselves and you own nothing except the debt that you owe to the banks. He said that in the, what, 1776? Mm -hmm. Let's fast forward to 2000 and, what is this, 20? Mm -hmm. 2120? Is he correct or not? He's correct. They own everything. 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 And if you don't own it, you've pledged it to the bank. You may own the title. You owe the debt on that to the bank. Americans walking around, homeowners? Yeah. Oh, they may have some equity. Most of it's mortgage debt. Okay? Americans... In general, that's true. Absolutely, in general, yeah. it's true. Yeah. I mean, there are exceptions. There are exceptions. Yeah. I think pretty much Jefferson's predictions were right. Mm -hmm. America had two enemies, private bankers and standing armies. I mean, you, you buy a house for, let's say, $100,000, you end up paying the bank $300,000. Absolutely, over 30 years. Yeah. And they get their money first. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Americans have looked at their mortgage statement, but when you buy that goddamn house, 90% of that money goes to the bank to pay off your interest. Not the principal, Jeffrey, the interest. You're not even knocking down your goddamn principal yeah. until you're 10 years into the payment. Yeah. But the privilege of having a home it's so important that you don't even look at it because you figure the future is going to bail you out. Fine, the banker said. Depend on the future. I'm going to take your money now. Two people at that table. The banker and you. The banker doesn't want to carry the risk. The banker wants you to carry the risk. The banker wants his money up front and gets it by terms of that mortgage agreement. 90% of that money on that payment goes to pay your interest Ten years later, you finally start working down on that debt. It's not even the fine print. It's in the print. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that that tends to be the way mortgages work. It is the way mortgages work. Unless you have all cash, and the Chinese sometimes do, and yeah. then everybody else is on the hook. Okay? Yeah. So this is what we've got. Yeah. We've got a system 
that was put in place by the sins of the father, William Patterson. Great sin, Bill. I mean, he, he, what he did change the world. England benefited by this primarily for 150 years and took over the world. They jumped ship in the next 50 years and put the Federal Reserve in the United States, and we used that banking system to propel us to the empire that England had been once. All right? But just as England's empire started faltering around 1850, so did America's. 1850 was the apogee of England's power as a world power. It started declining. Mm -hmm. It took a while to figure out yeah. that they were no longer king, but they started declining and then. Another hundred years before they gave up India. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Same way a hundred years later with the United States. In 1950, we were king of the pile, but that was our apogee. That was our peak. That was when our trade balance started going negative 20 years later. England's trade balance started going negative in 1870. You know when America's trade balance started going negative? 1971. Yeah. Coincidental? Uh, maybe. I don't think so. I don't think so. All right? So our, our balance started going negative. Our costs started going up. Our ledgers started going bad. But because we were the ones who had all the power in the world, we could stave off the the demise of this empire of paper and debt and credit far better than could England. Mm -hmm. All right. So here we are 20 years into the new century and we have staved off this collapse with every trick in the book. QE, paper, pray. I mean, things that, I mean, you talk about an artificially propped up market. Every time the Fed lowers interest rate, the market goes up. Markets do not depend on productivity nor on profit. They depend on Fed Cheap rates. Uh -huh. Now, may I interject again? Yes. Because we had a conversation previously about affirmations, and we concluded with a quote from you about, look at the nature of the self. It applies both to individuals and to nations. Look at self-interest. Involved. Uh, yes. And by so doing, you will come to understand the activities of nations as well as individuals. Yeah. And by looking at the nature of self-interest, then look at the nature of the self then being served. Yes. And you will determine from that what self is being served, the little self or the big self. That's what I implied. Yes. So where do you think things stand at this point in relationship to the the selves of the multitude of people on and, this earth, and as well the self of uh, let's call it the self of capitalism? <clears throat> you know, Jeffrey, I am glad I am sitting here with this conversation with you because I don't have this conversation with anybody else. I have some, but not at this level. And since most of my conversation with myself, I can't get it out of myself. It's sort of self-limiting. <laughs> you know, there's limits on this thing. Mm -hmm. All right. It's a brilliant question. It really is a brilliant question. And this is what I believe, is that we've reached the limitation of the individual self. We have expanded the illusion of the power of the self to its ultimate level. We have expanded these the limitation of the self to self-degree, where the self becomes self-destructive by its very nature. The isolated, differentiated, individualized self ultimately is not real. Because the self, even we believe it, we can perceive it and judge it and see it as that, is still only a part of a greater self that we cannot see. We have deluded ourselves into a hallucination of where we have, of where the Indians with their eternality of the vision call this Maya. Yeah. You know, this is Maya to the Indians. Mm -hmm. But to us, what do you mean, Maya? Look at this. You know, I mean, <laughs> pretty damn good Maya to me. Show me your Maya. You know, I'll put Maya up against you. Call that Maya all you want. You know, I can drive around a mine. I can fly it. Okay. Well, what has happened is this. Because of, I think you and I are among the very lucky ones at this time. Why? Because of our age and of our interest, we have discovered that not only are the Vedic ancient teachings of Patanjali true, but so are the, so is the wisdom of the native tribes on this earth and the original thought. Okay, 
that we spring from something that we no longer believe culturally in, that we have come from and are still a part of something bigger that we can't see for reasons that we've talked about, about perception and reality, all right? And that this self-created reality has reached its limitation like capitalism itself. Capitalism is the afterburner on self-interest. Capitalism is that part that gave whoosh a great burst of energy to the limited self. And it's the cost of it is the continuation of that system. It has led, Marx is right, capitalism is going to destroy itself, and it's doing so today. All right? But not for the reasons he thought. But he was right that it was going to destroy himself. And what you've raised the question, what are the greater implications to all these other systems that have created based upon the limited self? The limited self is the institutional support for the limited self is dissolving right now underneath us. This is what Bucky said. All right. We've reached its limits. All right. Now, because we are sentient beings at the dissolution of the limits and the, the reality that is created, it scares the shit out of us. Everything we've thought and we found it. This is why we've got an extreme right wing reaction to the shifts of change. I wrote a paper in 1961. I was in college. And uh, junior college, and my professor liked me, right? And he goes, uh, he announces to our class, he's a biology class. He says, "You know, there's a, a contest going, an essay contest going on. I think, you know, we should enter it. It talks about whatever I forget what the general thing was. And I know he's looking at me. <laughs> All right, I love Lewis Heinrich. You know, we liked each other. Okay, and I'm a kid. I'm a kid in this class. I'm seven, 18 years old." And I know he wants me to write my essay. And he's talking about we should. So I raised my hand and said, is there any prize? And he said, 50 bucks. So I wrote it and I won. And what I said was this. We are entering a period of intense change. And this change is going to be resisted by everybody <clears throat> because of the, the, the level of the change. And people are going to become afraid. And we're going to go back to, we're going to look to the past for direction which no longer exists, all right? It's going to be the future where it's going to be resolved, but because we're going to look to the past, we're going to see, we're going to be really ill-equipped to deal with the changes that are upon us. That was basically the gist of my paper in 1961. Mm -hmm. So here we are, 49 years later, and I'm saying the same thing, that we are, that these institutions that embody the, the, the beliefs and judgments of the past are gonna are falling away. They've reached their natural end. All right. They've reached their natural limitation. Science, as it is constructed, has reached its limitation. At least that's what I believe. Science doesn't believe. The, the pure science, the inquiring part of science is going to continue. The pure part of science that looks to where's the truth coming from is going to continue. But the science limited by by physical reality that only will look at certain things, only consider certain ideas in the constructs of past beliefs and judgments, which is not like, and you know what I'm talking about, is going to pass away. It's dying. It's dying because it can no longer, longer proceed. It can no longer produce the answers. There was a guy, uh, he wrote a book called uh, Paradigm Shifts. Do you know who he was? Yes, yeah, sure. Thomas Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn. The, the nature of scientific okay. revolutions. Terror. And what you're saying, obviously, is, is is that everything is coming to a halt on every level, if it's education, economics, science, politics, religion. Hold All on. of these things are breaking down. At once. At once. At once. Jeffrey. Yeah. One of my metaphors about it is that, you know, when you read a, 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 a sentence, the sentence is so self-done. But the sense is only part of the paragraph. Yeah. And the paragraph itself is only part of a chapter. And the chapter itself is only part of a book. I said, we're at the time when the, the books, like the series of, are at the end. Yeah. We're at the end of the series of books. Yeah. All right? Now. The encyclopedia. <laughs> is, is going away. Now. We've reached the end of the internet. <laughs> yeah, we've reached the end of the internet. Now, let me say something about, in, about myself. Ah. Uh, well, take, I have, a, take a deep breath. Okay. I am, my personal view of all this is very unique in the sense that I've been dissatisfied with the book. 
at a very deep level as long as I can remember. I know that not only this book, but the books before it created many things that people have enjoyed, thought, books, you know, inventions, stuff like that. But I have always believed at a basic level that this is a tragedy, that life is more than, should be more than this. One of my sayings in the Hate Ashbury was, if this is real, we're up shit creek. <laughs> All right? And so the fact that it's falling away, I don't like it any more than anybody else. I would rather us have a wonderful time. And I also know that Bucky said, emergence through emergency. That we are at a time where we no longer have the answers of the past. But I also believe... Who wrote that thing? The law, third law of thermodynamics uh, of uh, change. That that uh, what was his name? P Prigogine, Ilya Prigogine. Ilya Prigogine said, "Theory of dissipative structures, which is entropy. That when things disintegrate, two things happen. This is true for everything. They can fall away and just disappear into chaos." or spontaneously reorganize themselves into a higher level. Neither of which we have any control over. Okay? I would invoke Prigogine's promise at this point of the reorganization into a higher level in the, in the light of what it looks like chaos. All right? Who else wrote about this was a guy who wrote The, the Chaotic Age. Do you remember him? No. It was, it was beautiful. It was, it was, he was the guy who put Visa together, who you would think the least person to understand change, who put together the biggest credit card cooperation between banks. I forget his name was. We'll show it. Okay, yeah. The, the birth of the chaotic age. D Hawk. H O C K. D E E. Incredible book. Again, I read it because of Marshall Thurber. Okay? It's great to have certain filters in your life. Just like I have you to talk about this stuff with. Dehawk called this the birth of the chaotic age. That is the balance between order and chaos. Mm -hmm. That out of the, and that's why he had this thing about Shiva. That Shiva, the destruction, we all, ah, oh, destruction. Birth, destruction, like, like the planets. I have cast my, and it's not a bet. I don't think I, I'm a better, I'm a fool. And I'm willing to bet in a way that you shouldn't bet like I did with dropping my affirmations and losing all my money and going back and going, oh, my God, it said, if you could give it up, these things would happen, but you can't. I, I, I blew past it and just gave it up and lost everything. And now I'm 50 years later, again, doing affirmations with a totally different point of view, maybe part of the Dharma of my, my path. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what you're saying is that if, if we can but <laughs> become more mindful we have the possibility of becoming, of being forced to be the gods we are. Time and circumstance is forcing me as an individual. And I think humanity is the collective to become mindful out of pure survival, if that's what it takes. Daryl Robert Schoon. <laughs> That was beautiful. Uh, what an elegant exposition of a very, very complex and deep subject that affects everybody. 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 And uh, I hope everybody gets to view this conversation. Daryl, thank you so much for being with me. And thank you for those of our viewers who have made it to this point. Please share this video widely with your friends. And with your enemies. <laughs> <laughs> because they're the one and the same. We are all one after all. <laughs>